Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. Hey, it's the last talk here. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Hope you're enjoying DevConf as I am. I am here to tell you something, maybe interesting, maybe not. We'll see. About Python 3 and about the fact that you really should switch to Python 3 right now. It's too late, actually, but right now it's still better than, you know, before Christmas. So, who I am? I am a member of Python maintenance team in Red Hat. Uh, I am Pivo, I organized Pivo meetups in Ostrava. I am head of PyCon CZ conference organizers. I'm teaching and organizing Py PyLadies uh, lessons and courses in Ostrava. And in a private life, let's say, I don't have much time for that, but I'm a drummer and also a volunteer firefighter. What, in Python maintenance team, what are we work on? Uh, actually, we take care about, we do Python. It's not that surprising, right? But actually, we take care about uh, CPython development as well. A few members are core developers in a CPython interpreter. We do take care about uh, Python stacks in RHEL and Fedora, about some really important packages. So if you're enjoying a lot of Pythons in Fedora, for testing ready to use, uh, that's our work. Uh, we also we also moving things forward if necessary. So yeah, we are working right now on removing Python 2 from uh, from Next Fedora, and also we are ready to help upstream project and upstream developers. So if your project need you know some love to support Python 3, do not. Uh, wait and contact us, especially me, and I will help you to do it. I will help you crack the hard nuts. What I work on, my last big project was uh, to prepare Python free stack for Relate, because, yeah, next rel major release will be Python free. And I was working on the large projects which uh, Red Hat use in our software stacks, uh, which needs to be ported or at least support Python 3. Namely, it's a body, it's Fedora update system, it was Samba, I think that everybody knows Samba, it's a really large code base, and for example, Ansible, also a really big project based mainly on Python. So I was working still on Python maintenance, but helps these upstream projects to support Python 3 to welcome the future. First question I have for you, and I have, you know, some prizes. How old is Python? Where, I mean, where, when uh, the development of Python language starts? Raise your hand, please. Again, please. 28 years ago. Any other opinion? It was 30 years ago, but okay, you were close, okay. And I, you know, I cannot eat candy, so it's yours. <laughs> it's actually the same date as the first web page. Yeah, when I discovered the fact, it was really surprising. And it was the first Linux kernel, and also <coughs> Visual Basic. <laughs> second one, second candy. How old is Python 3? What's the release date of the first Python 3 release? 2008. 2008. Yes. <laughs> Please. Send it. Thank you. 2008, which is the same year as uh, GitHub was, you know, published as uh, first mobile phone with Android. Yeah, it's really old. And uh, Intel Atom family of processor was announced. So it's really long time. Ago. And you may or may not know that Python 3 is the first backward incompatible release, which means that if you write some software in Python 1 or Python 0 0.1, which was released in 1991, then it should work, <laughs> should work in Python 2.7 as well. So Python 3 is the first backward incompatible release. Another question. But I'm out of candy, sorry. Uh, please raise your, raise your hand if you know the Zen of Python. Like remember all of 
No, no, remember. Just know that something that, like it exists. Got a lot of people. Cool. The Zen of Python is the 90 rules which every Python developer should follow. But not only Python developer, as you can see, it's a general one, not uh, only for Python. If you don't know it, just open CLI, interactive session with your Python, Python 2 and Python 3, of course, and type import this and enter, and it will show, you, show up for you. And there is one really important and my favorite one. There should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it in language, in a Python language, or in your software, in your API, depends on you. And because, you know, from Python 0 0.9 from 1991 to Python 3 in 2008, a lot of stuff accumulated in the language, a lot of new features, a lot of ways how to solve a simple problem, multiple ways, and it was kind of mess. And not all the ways was, you know, optimal, optimized for a best performance, etc., etc., etc. So decision was made to break the bandwidth compatibility, to let the Python again be uh, fit this all of these rules. So that's the one reason, and the second one is, of course, <coughs> Unicode. <laughs> okay, that's the history, forget about it. Why should you care? Why should you care about Python 3? Uh, the most important thing you should know if you're still using Python 2 is that Python 2.7, end of life, is really near. The support will be dropped in the first January of 2020. If you wanna count downers like I do, just open the page pythonclock.org and you will see it's exactly 11 months and six days, or seven days right now. So yeah, the Python 2.7 will be unsupported by upstream. And as you can see in uh, other talks today from, for example, Victor Stinner, uh, Python core developers do a lot of work regularly, so who will do the same for you? Who will support the language? Who will fix all the CVEs, etc.? It's an open question, but still, if you can, you should drop it as well. Linux distros, Linux distribution, don't ship Python 2.7 by default for a few years right now. For example, Fedora 23 in 2015 was without Python 2 by default. Ubuntu two years later. Everything is going that way to you know, keep you aware that something's changing. The most important libraries, libraries and projects support Python 3 without any problem. Actually, if you take a look on this page, Python 3 uh, readiness.org, you will see that 359 out of 360 most downloaded projects on PyPI support Python 3. The one which doesn't is Apache Beam. I don't know why. But if a lot of projects and a lot of huge code bases, I mean like NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, and all of this all of this stuff support Python 3, why you should know. A list of projects with, uh, will stop supporting Python 3. You can find it uh, on pythonfreestatement.org. And I think that you will be surprised. Check this page. There is an interactive, interactive chart when you will see when each project will stop support Python 2. And uh, I think that you will be surprised. Because, for example, Pandas did it already. Uh, NumPy and SciPy is, on, is uh, in bug fixes only state, and a lot of projects will follow. And a lot of projects will do it before 2020, in this year, for example, in a half. Uh, as, uh, as somebody told me, the whole next uh, Samba, Samba release will be the last with Python 2 support. And then the sub Python 2 support there will be dropped as well. So be aware. Python 3, Python 3 means performance boost for you. I don't have any exact uh, examples here, but if you uh, try to find something on YouTube, you will find talks from huge conferences about 
uh, for example, look big websites like Instagram or Facebook switching to Python, uh, switching to Python free, and what does it mean for their per performance? And yeah, it's performance boost. So it's a uh, Good also for, not for you, but also for your servers. And Python 3 contains useful new features. If you want to support both, you can. If you want to use new features, you can in Python 3, you know. You can drop Python to support, I think, as well. Why not? OK, let's talk a little bit about strategies, how to do it. There are multiple ways how you can support Python 3. The first one is Keep Python 2 and Python 3 code base in separating branches, which means that you will have to do all the bug fixes twice. You will have to uh, do a review twice. You will have to do everything twice. But it possibly makes sense for your scenario. It depends on your project. But it's not the best way how to do it. But in this case, you, will, you can use all the new features in Python 3. That's cool. Use Tools like 2 to 3 or 3 to 2, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is actually not that good idea. If your project is really small, you can set up something like 2 to 3 or 3 to 2 in your continuous integration or some other pipeline, and it will convert your code dynamically for you, which means that it will still maintain Python 2 and it will automatically uh, transfer to Python 3. But it doesn't work on a large code basis of course, and if your project is small, why not use Python 3 or, and I think that you won't be surprised, the best strategy to support Python 3 is to write compatible code. It's not that hard as it may look, because a lot of features from Python 3 was actually backported to Python 2 in some way to make this transition simpler as possible. And we, as a Python maintenance team, we are helping to do it even simpler and even easier to, for you. So how to make my code compatible? How to do it? What you will know? What you will need to do it? You will have to have good test coverage. <coughs> test coverage is a very important thing if you want to change, basically, the language you are using for your project. I know, I know, I know, nobody wants to write tests, right? But there is, I think, first advantage to writing tests is that if your test coverage is really good, you can uh, give the task of transition to Python 3 to some, you know, trained monkey to do it for you, because all you need to do is make all tests passing in Python 2 and Python 3, and that's all. And uh, I don't know if I want to say that, but Actually, because Samba, Ansible, Body, and a lot of other tools uh, has good, co good test coverage, I don't really understand how it, look, how it works in the background, and I'm still able to port it to Python 3. So if you have a good test coverage, it will take some time, but not that much. You will need to make some decision, of course, because, for example, as uh, we will discuss it later a little bit, but in Python 2 was just variable with some base string, unique code, whatever, if it doesn't work, just put there some decode, encode, decode, encode, and it will work. So this is not true anymore, so you will have to decide whether this variable should contain unicode or should it contain bytes, etc., etc. So it will need some decision, probably from a people who understand the project, and it will take some time, some time, of course. But as I said, with test coverage, you can do the work, uh, some intern can do the work for you. OK, let's take a look on uh, common things you will have to deal with when supporting Python 3. And because I said that the best strategy is support both at the same time, let's take a look how to do it, how to support both Pythons in the same time. And we can take a look also why these things uh, had to be changed. Let's start with something really simple, which all of us know. For example, print. Print was a statement, keyword in Python 2, and print is a function in Python 3. 
Actually, you can use print as a function also in Python 2 if you, from Python 2.6, if you use a future import, so it means from future import print function, and ta-da, Python 2 has also print as a function. You may wonder, why the hell something that simple and it need to be changed, really, from statement to function? Why? What's the benefit of this? Let me show you. What if you want to use more complex print, like this one? Oh, it's ugly. Right? Or not? I think so. And the same print, there is only one difference, and I want to know what the difference between two the prints does. Who knows it? Maybe I find one more candy. Ah, yeah, is it? So. Yeah, right. The second print contains commas at the end of the line, and the result is that it don't put the new line at the end of the string hello world printed on standard error output. Oh, that's not look good, right? So if the things go more complex, it makes sense to make it easier and more understandable by readers and more readable. So in Python 3, print is just a function. It's simple and it has similar API with the rest of the Python ecosystem and it's far, it's more, more, more readable than Python 2 version. I can roughly imagine that I will teach PyLadies on courses how to do a print without new line. It's impossible. But in Python 3, it's perfect. Handling exception. If you have only one exception, let's say zero division error, everything is fine, and you don't want to store it in a variable, let's do it this way. Of course, you cannot divide by zero, right? Only Chuck Norris can do it. But what if you want to catch two exceptions? Mm, I remember that there was some comma somewhere. Let's do it this way. Will it work in Python 2? No? What would the second one do? Sorry? Don't be scared. I'm not bite. Missing your brackets. And what this will do without brackets? No, it will work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because there's no brackets here. It will store, if it catch the zero division error, it will store the exception in variable with this name. Oh, no, no. The right way how to do the same in Python 2 is using brackets around a list of exceptions and another comma and then the name of the variable you want to store exception in. Ah, oh, come on, it's ugly and everybody can write it in a bad way. So Python 3 introduced a new keyword here, S, which is good separator between the list of exceptions and the name of the variable you want to store exception in. So it's more readable, it's less, you know, uh, ready for mistakes, etc. Another thing, how much time I get? Ah, it's correct. Another thing, actually you don't want to change anything to uh, benefit from it is exception chains. Imagine you have this simple code, you want to read some config file from, from disk, and you want to catch exception uh, raised by Python IO error if the file is not found and you want to raise your own exception. For example, config not found error. With Python 2, you get only this traceback, this short config not found error. But in Python 3, because the exception stack was redesigned uh, and it store exception in a separated objects, you will have this very useful traceback which will help you a lot especially when porting, because you know, when porting, the things may go really, really, really wrong, so you can benefit from the information about all exceptions rise at from the back to the top. So this is, this is a really cool new feature. You don't have to do anything special to benefit from it. Okay, next one, sorting. Using CMP in Python 2. 
Python 2 has, uh, you can, you know, define some function which uh, will work as a comparator function of two values, and you can use this, you can use this function as a keyword argument for sorted function. It works. It has a v visible disadvantage because the compare function has to be called every time you want to compare two objects, two values. So it, it's, yeah, it's disadvantage of this, of, of this approach. And in Python 2 and in Python 3, of course, you can use a key, a key keyword argument for sorted, which will also use the function defined by you or a lambda if you want, but with the key, the function you define has to be called only once for every value, not every time you want to compare two values. So, for example, for sorting list, this approach is much faster. And again, if you remember the Zend of the Python, you remember the uh, one rule I like the most. Now it's, there is no one way, and not neither one obvious way how to do it. The same thing applies if you want to implement comparison for your objects. And again, you can use the CMP, CMP special method for your classes. But in Python 2.1, I'm not kidding, in Python 2.1 was implemented the rich comparison, which means that you can compare in a lot of ways. You don't have to, because in the previous example here, you always have to implement the full comparison. Comparison which will return every, which will return a value representing all the comparison situation. But with the rich comparison, you can choose only the one you want to implement, lower than, greater than, equality, etc., etc. And again, we have multiple ways how to do and how to solve kind of simple problem. So in Python 3, the CMP, the less optimized uh, way, was removed. Very common thing you have to deal with. Imports. In Python 2, uh, Python 2 prefers local files instead of the globals, which is a problem. Because if you, wanna, if you have a large code base, it's a high probability that you will name one of your files the same like uh, the name of something in the standard library, and Python 2 will prefer the local copies, the local files, uh, instead of the global Python standard library. From Python 2.5, you can, you can use the dot in imports to make it relative, explicitly, but in Python 3, you have to use the dot to make, it, uh, to make import be relative, which means, uh, in Python 3, if you write some import, it's always the global one. If you want to import something in the folder you are or in your package structure, you have to use the dot in imports. If you want to uh, standardize the approach and also make the code compatible for 2 and 3 Python, you can use the future import from future import absolute imports, and this will make all imports by default absolute, and if you want a relative one, you can use the dot. Again, very simple fix to make it work in Python 2 and Python 3. Data formats, let's talk about it a little bit. What is data format? Data format is a way how you take any information, like images, like music, anything you want, it's a way how to store it on disk like bytes, but for images and for music, we know it, right? We have a lot of photos and MP3s. But what about text? What is text? Is it UTF-8, ASCII, or anything else? You can pretend that text is only a sequence of ASCII cards and store it at bytes. And then you meet František Březina, and your application will crash with a huge Unicode decode error, and you will try to place something, decode, encode, ah, and still doesn't work. Doesn't work like that. 
And also, you cannot ignore emojis. Sorry, but you cannot, because it will make your users sad. Emojis, you know, rule the world. And Python upstream developers know it. So after a lot of years, they decided that uh, Python 3 should contain a separated uh, types for text, which is in Python 3 Unicode by default, and bytes, which is bytes, nothing more. Plain text is a myth. So Python 3 has a setter string, setter type for text, which is Unicode, and bytes for binary data. And this is the, I think, maybe the hardest thing to port because you will have to make a decision whether you want to store text or bytes. And for example, if somebody is porting the code for you, it might be even harder because I don't know what this variable contains. I don't, I cannot make a decision for you. So this is if you will have, for example, some intern or some student to work for you and port Python to Python 3 compatible form, this is up to you, not up to any trained monkey you will have to decide. This is the decision I was talking about. <laughs> changes in the standard library. Standard library, also, again, contains a lot of changes. For example, some renames, built-ins, and range, x range, and reduce, move to functal modules, uh, module, et cetera. Row input is not row input anymore. It's just input, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that big deal. Maybe it is for you, but I'm not taking it as is because uh, there is a lot of modules which will help you to build a bridge between Python 2 and Python 3, and you don't uh, need to take care about these simple changes anymore. I will show it to you later. Python C extensions. Is there anybody who needs to write Python C extensions? Nobody. Yay! Oh, okay, you. <laughs> of course. Uh, if you need to write Python C extensions, you are gonna, you are gonna have a bad time, honestly. Because Python upstream developers said, we are trying to develop language which will be you know, easy to write, easy to read, easy to beginners, etc. Et Why would somebody write Python extensions in C? We are making Python for easy development. Why you C? <laughs> to make Python extensions. So uh, my advice is if you really <laughs> need to do it, you're going to have a bad time because uh, Python developers say nobody should do this, so we are not keeping backwards compatibility <coughs> in any way, and everything change it. But help is on the way, so we have solution also for this. So if you want to write C extensions, I will show you how to do it. But if you can choose, please use Cyton or CFFI and C types. Cyton is a, you know, a modified Python, which can be easily translated to C code, and it makes basically C extension for you, and for basically no price. And CFFI or C types are modules for calling uh, existing C functions from Python. So if you can choose, please do not write C extensions directly using Python C API, use Cyton or CFFI or C types. But if you have to, I will show you how. I will show you how, what to use. Help is on the way, as I said. If you are a really conservative guy, if you really, uh, do you really think it's the right time to support Python 3? Really? It's only 11 years. I'm not sure whether it's stable or not. If you are this type of conservative guy, we wrote conservative porting guide for you. You will find it on the reader docs, and it's the complete list of the things you will have to change in your code to support Python 3, of course, and what to do it, what is prevalence of the changes, uh, why this was changed in the Python from time to time, <laughs> and, uh, and also how to do it, because of course nobody wants to do it manually, so there is uh, help how to use tool called Python Modernize, what you know, options, what arguments to use that only the one thing is changing 
uh, in the time. So it's really conservative, and it's really here to you what you need to do to support Python, Python 3 in your code base, and also Python 2.7, and if you, be, if you will be careful, also Python 2.6. Come on. The 6 library was mentioned before. Why it's called 6? Because 2 times 3 is 6, right? Uh, 6 contains, a, it's a wrapper and contains some utilities to help you building the bridge between Python 2 and Python 3, uh, which means, for example, if you want to import something which was renamed in Python 3, you can import it from the 6, and it will uh, do basically the work for you. So if you run the code in Python 2, it will import the, in the Python 2 name. If you work the, if you want, if you run the code in Python 3, it will import it under the Python 3 name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, contains a lot of stuff uh, which help you with Unicode, etc. So six library. Uh, it's also in the conservative pointing guide. So, yeah, and it really works and it really help you. Trust me. This is a project which helps basically uh, the one from you who need to uh, who need to write uh, Python C extensions. It's something like six. It contains a lot of macros for C, uh, and it help you to port Python C extensions as well. And the last but not least, wait for it, it's me. Do not hesitate to write me, to call me. I am a firefighter, so I'll pick your phone even on a midnight, you know, it's not a problem at all. My girlfriend hates me because of that, but it's not a problem at all. Do not hesitate, call me, uh, send me an email, I will help you, I will help to, I don't know, set some pipeline for your project to support Python 3 in the right time, which is uh, now. Thank you for your attention. We have plenty of time for questions, so any questions? You can also catch me in the hall, for example, if you... Yeah? Hmm? No. <laughs> That's a question I heard a lot. Yeah. I repeat the question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was if there will be some new breakages, some backward incompatibilities in next Python. No, hopefully not. <laughs> but we may release Python 4, but it will keep backward compatibility. So don't worry. Nobody, even the Python upstream developers, and me, neither. Nobody wants to repeat the same process again. We are fighting with we are fighting with this for ten years, so we don't want to do it anymore. You, you mentioned that uh, test coverage is important when you are pointing to Python three. So I wonder, like, which is going to be okay if your tests are also in Python two? If your tests are also in Python two, uh, yeah, the test what to do. If your test coverage is good, but your tests are also in Python, in Python 2, question. So the best approach to port, basically, if you have some tests or if you have, for example, good <laughs> test coverage, is to set up some tool, for example, Tox. Tox, or you may know Travis, etc. It's a tool which can run your test on, in multiple, in multiple uh, languages in the same time, so you can pick the versions of Python you want to support, for example, 2.6, 7, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., etc., and then you, <laughs> then the, you have only one task to solve: make all green. That all sounds simple, I know, but if you test R in Python 2, and it's a, it's yeah, it's common scenario, then you will have to fix your test first before you can, you know, hire a trained monkey. Uh, but it's not that big deal, usually, because how many you know, features you are using in tests? It's basically call the function and compare the results, and call the function and download something from web and compare the results. So it's not that big deal in tests, basically, but yeah, of course, if you want to store Unicode somewhere, you will accept Unicode in tests, so it needs some work to be done. 
Any more questions? The question is whether consensus is that it was a bad idea to break the bedrock compatibility. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, the consensus is that it wasn't a bad idea to break it because, you know, we will have to do it sooner or later. So it's, and everything was prepared and the first plan was, okay, just drop Python 2 at all and make only Python 3, it's cool. And then somebody scared, are you crazy? Do you know how many lines of code I've written in Python 2? It's, no, no idea. And then uh, the deadline, uh, the AOL for Python 2 was postponed and postponed and postponed and postponed. So nobody uh, actually, except that will be that big deal to transform, and that's a good lesson we learned, so we don't want to do it anymore. So yeah, but it, we will have to be done sooner or later still. So job is done, basically. Question is, is there any chance that the deadline of uh, Python 2 LL in 2020 will be postponed again? No, there is no chance to Python 2 to be the deadline for, from uh, the upstream developers to be postponed, of course. There are projects like, I, I don't know, uh, Tauten. Tauten is basically Python 2, forked from upstream with some backported features from Python 3. So it will probably be somebody who will take care of Python 2. But it's a lot of work, really. So I don't think, the upstream developers don't want to do it anymore. Uh, actually, the first announced deadline was 2020. And then people start asking, like, and December 2020? Be before, no, first January 2020, and that's all. No more discussing. So, no, Python upstream developers don't want to do it. I don't think anyone want to do it. No, there's, I think that there's no chance. It's, we are too close to remove Python 2 from everywhere. We don't want to postpone it. And you know, we are, want to party next year on PyCon, so. Yeah, yeah, Py on PyCon US, there will be a huge party for removing Python 2, so we don't want to post, you know, who wants to postpone party, okay? <laughs> <laughs> any, more, any more questions? Major, as, as I, uh, uh, is there any major libraries which don't be poured to Python 3 or at least to support Python 3? I would say no, but depends how you know, weird your dependencies is. Uh, there are some, of course, but for every important library, if the upstream developers don't want to support Python 3, there is a fork which supports Python 3. So it may, if you're using some you know, not that common uh, libraries, it will need maybe to change your dependencies and to adapt to the new one. But as I said before, on the PyPI, the 300 and 360 most downloaded libraries is done, are done. So. And you can also check it on Python 3 readiness. There is a huge list, so it's not a problem. Any more questions? Yeah, as I said before, there are a lot of projects already dropping or already, we've already dropped Python 2 support, so you might be really surprised when you do uh, update of your software stack. And if this presentation would be really boring for you, and it's evening, I know, I can understand, but please remember one thing. If you start new project or if you actively work on some project, move it or start it with Python 3. Because if you don't, 
after 10 years from now, somebody like me will need to do a work for you. And I don't want to. <laughs> okay? So please, every new project starting Python 3.7. It's cool, full of new features. Every project you need to actively maintain, Python 3.6, Python 3.7, depends on what you want, but move it. It's not that bad. Somebody did it, and it's a huge project, so you can too, trust me. Thank you very much.